Okay, hence let's go get topic three of the 2.2 notes. Um, in topic three, we're going to talk about something called water potential. Um, this is usually a concept that students aren't super familiar with um, prior to taking this class, uh, but it's pretty a yeah, pretty easy concept once you get it. Um, so we'll just dive right into it. So let's start with like the actual definition of water potential. It, it says that water potential is a measurement of the amount of free energy found in a mole of water. So this is um, basically measuring how much free energy a, a solution of water has um, or the water in that solution has. Uh, free energy is a term that students aren't usually familiar with before taking this class. Um, and it refers to how much energy uh, uh, something has available to do work, which really in science just means how much energy do you have available to, to potentially move? Um, that's free energy. And so the, the easiest way I can describe water potential is that it's a measurement of how likely water molecules will, will want to move if given the opportunity to move somewhere else. And so when I say uh, that uh, a substance of water when I say a sample of water has high water potential, what that means is that, that those water molecules, um, they have a, a lot of free energy and given the opportunity to move somewhere else, they're going to move somewhere else. Okay, that's what it means to have a high water potential. That's water that's ready to go somewhere else when given the opportunity to go somewhere else. A low water potential would be the opposite. So if I say that um, this water has a low water potential, that would be water molecules that um, don't have a lot of free energy, which means that if they were given the opportunity to move somewhere else, they um, are gonna pass on that opportunity. They're just gonna stay where they are. Um, they don't really wanna move um, and they're okay with that. So high water potential is water that wants to move somewhere else if given the opportunity. Low water potential is water that wants to stay put. Uh, that's that's the gist of what water potential is. And so there's a couple of key concepts that we're going to uh, go through in this video. The first key key concept that you just need to have memorized starting immediately is this bullet point right here. It says water molecules move from areas of high water potential to areas of low water potential. So um, this will always be true. Water will always move, always from an area of higher water potential towards an area of, of lower water potential. That's the direction that water likes to move. Um, and which makes, hopefully that, that kind of makes sense with the definition of water potential. If I have some water over here that has a high water potential, like this water is ready to go somewhere else. And then over here on this side, I have water that has a low water potential and it doesn't really want to move. Well, then obviously what's going to happen is the water that wants to move will move to the other side and the water that doesn't want to move is going to stay where it's at. Um, so again, water will always go from areas of high water potential to areas of low water potential. Please memorize that immediately. Um, now, to, uh, water potential is something that we can calculate. We can actually measure and calculate a value for water potential, um, which reminds me that the, the, the symbol for water potential is this Greek letter psi. Um, it looks like a little trident. That's the symbol for water potential. And it's measured in units called bars. And so that bars is the units for, for water potential. So I could say that this water right here has a water potential of negative two and a half bars. It's just that's the unit for um, water potential. So keep that in mind. Um, you don't need to worry about it too much right now, right now. But we'll we'll look at some examples in a, in a, soon, in a moment. Um, but anyway, there is a formula for water potential. And so the, the, to calculate the water potential of uh, a sample of water or a solution that contains water, um, you would uh, need to know two things. You would need to know the pressure potential and the solute potential. And if you take the pressure potential and the solute potential and you add it together, that's going to equal the, the water potential. Um, and we'll look at these two components in a second, um, what the pressure and solute potential are and what that means. Um, but just know that it's, it's those two things added up together. Uh, which we'll look at in a moment. But before we look at that, let's. there's two more big concepts I need you guys to, to memorize immediately. And that one of them is this bullet right here. It says an open container of pure water has a water potential equal to zero. And so if, if you ever have a situation where you have pure water, let's say in this cup I have pure water, and it's in an open container like this cup, then um, that means I know with 100% certainty that this water has a water potential of zero. Um, that's just something you guys need to have memorized. Pure water, open container, has a water potential of zero. Now, the weird part is that zero, a water potential of zero is actually really high. That's a high water potential. Um, and that's because, and you'll see this soon, um, water potential values are usually always negative. Um, 
And so when you have a water potential of zero, that's always going to be greater or higher than a negative water potential. And so, uh, again, usually the, if, if there's negative water potentials, zero is always going to be higher than negative values. So zero is actually a high water potential because it's, it's higher than negative numbers. Um, so pure water in an open container, that actually has a lot of free energy. I mean, that, that has a lot, a high water potential, even though it's, it's the water potential is zero, that, that's a high water potential. And so if I say that uh, this has a water potential of zero, and then I have this other cup, and then in this cup, the water potential is negative five, well, zero is greater than negative five, like that's a higher water potential. Um, or if I say in this cup, there's a water potential of negative five, and in this other cup, there's a water potential of negative 12, well, be careful because negative five, that's a higher water potential than negative 12. So be careful with your, your negatives. Um, so make sure you guys know that, okay? Um, and then lastly, one last important concept is that whenever you take um, a solute, which is some kind of chemical or substance that's being dissolved in water, and you add that solute and dissolve it in a container of water, that's always going to lower the water potential um, and make it uh, uh, smaller. It's gonna decrease the water potential. Um, and so if you're, if you're starting with a water potential of zero, like pure water, and you start adding some solute to it, like a sugar or salt or ions of some sort, and you start dissolving it in that water, that's going to start the, making the, the water potential more and more negative. Um, lower and lower and lower. So the more solute you have dissolved in the water, the, the more negative the water potential is going to, going to become. And so that's a third thing that you guys need to kind of immediately memorize. Um, so if you look at this picture right over here, it kind of ties in everything that I'm saying. Uh, if you look here, I have this U-shaped tube. And at the bottom of this U-shaped tube, there's a semi-permeable membrane separating the left and the right side. And so let's say that the semi-permeable membrane is permeable to water. So water is able to move across this, this membrane here at the bottom. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and say that the membrane is not permeable to the solute. So these dots, that's, that's the solute, the chemical dissolved in the water. And let's pretend that the dots are not permeable to this membrane. And so the dots can't move across the membrane, but the water can. And so if you look here at, at, at these two different sides, on the left side, we have pure water in an open container. So if I asked you what's the water potential on the left side, you should automatically know it's going to be zero because I just told you that pure water in an open container has a water potential of zero, as also stated in this picture. Now on the right side, you have some, some, some kind of solute dissolved in it, and that's going to make the water potential um, more negative. It's going to lower the water potential. So I know on the right side, the water potential is going to be some negative number because there's, there's stuff dissolved in it. And then uh, the last thing I could ask you is what, in which direction will the water move? And if you look at this picture, um, well, actually, if you just think about osmosis in general, like not even thinking about water potential, if you just think about osmosis and the way that water likes to move, water, uh, and we talked about this in the topic two notes, water will always move to the, to the side that has a higher solute concentration, the side that has a higher concentration of stuff dissolved in it, that's the direction water is going to want to go in an attempt to dilute that side. By having more water on that side, it's going to make it less concentrated on that side, which is going to accomplish this goal of getting closer to the, the same concentration on both sides by moving water to the side that's more concentrated and diluting it. So in this picture, it should be no shock after understanding topic two that water, there's going to be a net movement of water to the right side. Water is going to want to go to, to the right side, the side that has a higher concentration to get closer, to make this side have a, a lower concentration by adding more water to it so that both sides are, are closer to being the same concentration. Um, now, in terms of water potential, that also makes perfect sense because we just said that the water potential on the left side is zero and the water potential on the right side is some negative number. So uh, if you remember, water will always move from a high water potential area to an area that has a lower water potential. So even according to water potential, we would conclude the same thing, that water, yes, for sure, will move to the right side. There's gonna be this net overall movement of water to the right side of this, this little setup here. Um, so now uh, the last couple things I want to talk about then in topic three before we look at some examples is these two variables. So like I said, you can calculate water potential if you know the pressure potential and the solute potential. We'll start with the pressure potential. Um, the, the good thing about the pressure potential is that uh, you do not have to calculate it. Um, the pressure potential is 
going to be given to you in the question. The question will just tell you what the pressure potential is. Um, a lot of times the pressure potential will be zero, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, but if it's not zero, they're just going to tell you in the question. They'll say, assume the pressure potential is positive one, or assume the pressure potential is negative three. And then you're just going to plug in that number for the pressure potential. Um, but what you do need to know is you need to know conceptually the concept of pressure potential. You need to know what's the difference between something, water having a positive pressure potential versus a negative pressure potential, which I'll explain in one second. Um, but in terms of actually knowing the number, the calculation for it, you, you don't need to do that. They'll, they'll tell you what it is. And then there's the solute potential. That is a calculation you'll have to figure out. And so I'll show you the formula for that and how to figure that out in a moment. But let's start with the pressure potential. So if you guys look here, uh, the pressure potential is referring to how much um, pressure is exerted on a sample of water compared to the, the surrounding solution or the surrounding water. So if you imagine, for example, uh, an easy example would be like a, a water balloon and you fill up that water balloon with lots of water. Inside that water balloon, you're gonna, you're gonna now have pressurized water. That water is, there's a pressure being exerted on that water. That would be what we call a, a positive pressure potential. And so a positive pressure potential would be um, whenever you have a situation where the water is pressurized, where there's a pressure being exerted on that water more than the, the surrounding water. In cells, this happens all the time, um, specifically in plant cells. In plant cells, I talked about this in the last video, how they like to be in hypotonic solutions, solutions that are less concentrated than inside the cell. And so water will always want to go into the cell in a hypotonic solution because inside the cell it's more concentrated so water is going to want to go into the cell and that fills up the cell but in plant cells they don't burst or lice um, because they have a cell wall so instead they become um, turgid which means they become pressurized and, and this is good for plant cells they want to be have these nice pressurized cells that would be an example of a positive pressure potential okay th this water is more is, is, is more pressurized than the surrounding water outside the cell now, a negative pressure potential, that's that's the opposite, which is a little trickier to think about, but this is like um, depressurized water. So this is water that has um, that's under less pressure than the surrounding water, so almost kind of like a, a, a little vacuum. And so um, a good example of that would be like in this, in this plant cell here, you have a hypertonic solution that this plant cell is in, and so this the water is going to want to go out of the cell where there's a higher concentration, and that's going to leave the inside of the cell with it, this depressurized situation here. And so the water remaining inside the cell is going to be um, less pressurized than the surrounding cell. And that's, that's what a negative pressure potential means. A negative pressure potential is a situation like this where the water is um, being uh, depressurized, if that kind of makes sense. Maybe not the most scientific way to say it, but when the that water is there's a, a pressure exerted on that water that's less than the surrounding water um, that would be a, a, a negative pressure potential and then a pressure potential equal to zero is when the the water is um, there's no extra pressure or depressurization of that water that water has the same pressure as the surrounding water so like a cell in an isotonic solution that would probably have a pressure potential equal to zero it's the pressure inside the cell versus the pressure outside the cell is, is basically the same. And so that's the, the concept of pressure potential. Now, what you what what happens a lot of times in problems is they'll they'll say that there's an open container. And so if you have an open container of water or a, a solution where it's a, there's an open container, that will always be a pressure potential of zero if you have an open container. Because if you have an open container, there's no way for the water to be a different pressure than everything else if it's an open cell or an open container. And so if a question's talking about some kind of open container situation, just know that that means the pressure potential is zero. So in the, in the questions you get, like on a, on a test or the AP test, um, they might sneak that in there somewhere that we're talking about an, an open beaker or something. Well, that means that the pressure potential is zero. And if the pressure potential wasn't zero, they would tell you in the question, they would say, assume the pressure potential is plus two or something, and then you would just use that number. And so that's that's one component of, 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 of finding the water potential is knowing the pressure potential. Hopefully conceptually that makes sense, the difference between a positive versus a negative pressure potential. Now the other component is a solute, is what's called the solute potential. Now this does have a formula that you guys are expected to be able to use and, and calculate 
with. And so here's the, the formula for solute potential. And um, this is going to depend on the concentration of the solute in the solution. And so um, the, the formula is right here. You don't need to memorize this formula. It's provided to you on your AP exam formula sheet. But it's, uh, it's, it's the solute potential equals negative ICRT. And then in these notes, it talks about what each of those variables mean, which is also something you don't really need to memorize because on your formula sheet, it tells you what each variable means in case you forget. But real quick, the I stands for the ionization constant. And this is how many dissolved particles will form in water if you put one molecule of that substance in water. So this is going to depend on the substance. So like for sodium chloride or like salt, if you put a piece of sodium chloride in water, like one molecule of NaCl in water, that will dissociate into two ions, a sodium ion and a chlorine ion that are now floating around in the water. So we would say that has an ionization constant of two. It breaks apart into two pieces in water. Whereas sugar or glucose, when you put sugar or glucose in water, it stays one piece. So like if you take a molecule of C6H12O6, you put it in water, it's going to stay one molecule of C6H12O6 now just floating around in the water. So that would have an ionization constant of one. Um, if this makes sense, great. If it doesn't make sense, it's not a big deal because um, on the on a test question or on your formula sheet, it tells you what the ionization constant is for salt and what it is for sugar. So, um, or you can just memorize that for salt, it's two, and for sugar, it's one. Uh, but those are usually the two examples. It's either going to be sugar or salt, and it's going to be at one or two. Um, I gave you this third example, but you don't need to worry about an example like this, but this, this would be an ionization constant of three because one molecule of calcium chloride, if you put that in water, it forms three different ions. It forms one of these calcium ions and two of these chlorine ions. So three different pieces that it breaks into when it, it goes into water. But anyway, that's the ionization constant. C is the molar concentration. So the, the concentration of that solution um, measured by its molarity. So whatever the molarity of that solution is, that's what you're going to plug in for C. Um, and then R is a constant, it's a, it's a pressure constant, meaning that it's always, you're always going to plug in the same number. It's this number right here, 0 0.0831. You will always plug that in for R. You don't need to memorize that number. It's given to you on your formula sheet. And then lastly, T is the temperature. And this is where um, students mess up. The, the T, you're going to plug in the temperature, but you're not plugging in degrees Celsius. You have to plug in Kelvin. And so, um, and it says this on the formula sheet, it says T is the temperature in Kelvin, and then it gives you the formula for Kelvin in case you don't know it. But you got to, don't forget, because it is, it does tell you on the formula sheet, but students, when they're working through problems, they don't look at the formula sheet and they forget. And so just make sure for temperature, you don't plug in Celsius, you have to plug in Kelvin, um, which to find Kelvin, you just take the degree Celsius and you add 273. So if you, if you plug in those variables, you'll get the solute potential, which will help you find the, the water potential. Um, and so in your notes, there's a few examples. And so um, usually we do these in class. Like this first question, it says, calculate the water potential of an open beaker containing a 0.1 molar solution of NaCl at 25 degrees. And so uh, for this question, um, I can go ahead and show you this as an example, just so you guys can see. Let me pull up my notes here. So, uh, let's see. If I look at that question here in the notes. Just to show you an example of, of this math stuff. And so to find the, the, the water potential of this, um, you need to know the formula. So the formula is the water potential equals the solute, I mean the pressure potential plus the solute potential, right? This is the, this is how you find the water potential. You have to have those two things and add it together to find the water potential. Um, now in this situation, the pressure potential is going to be zero because if you read carefully, it says it's in an open container. So I know that the pressure potential is zero because it's in an open container. So there can't be a positive or negative pressure potential. So we can kind of ignore pressure potential for this question, which is actually a common scenario where you can just ignore the pressure potential. So really the, the water potential actually just equals the solute potential. If you can find the solute potential, that's gonna equal the water potential because um, there's no pressure potential. And the formula for the solute potential is negative I C R T. So you're basically just gonna plug in these numbers here. And so you, for I, 
you would plug in, since this is talking about salt, NaCl, you can look at your notes, um, but for salt, the ionization constant is two. And then the concentration of this solution, it says it's a 0.1 molar solution. So the molarity is 0.1, you're gonna plug that in for C. And then R is a constant, which is just this number right here in your notes. It, it'll be given to you, but it's 0.0831. And then T is the temperature. Be careful because, like I said, a lot of students will plug in 25 for T, but it has to be in Kelvin. So if you take 25 degrees and you convert it to Kelvin, that's going to be 298. And so there's your I, your C, your R, your T. You plug it all in, and then you find um, the answer on your calculator. So if you plug this into your calculator, um, let's see, you get 2 times 0.1 times 0 0.0831 times 298. And the answer would be, if we rounded two decimal places, 4.95. And the unit is bars. That's the unit for water potential. So that would be the water potential. But this would actually be wrong, because I made a mistake here. If you were um, paying close attention, I forgot the negative. And so don't forget the negative. The and so really, this should have been negative 2 times this times this times this, which would make my answer negative. And so really, this would be the, um, the water potential, because this is the solute potential. And in this case, the solute potential is going to be the water potential, because there's no pressure potential. Um, but just so you guys know, the, the solute potential will always be negative, unless it's zero. It'll be zero if we were talking about pure water, because in pure water, the concentration is zero. So this would just all equal zero. Um, but if it's not... If there is a concentration, a molarity, then it's going to be some negative number, okay? It's always going to be negative. So if you forgot your negative, be careful because you, you would get no points on a, on a test question if you forget the negative. Um, so just watch out for that. Um, the second one here is just like that one. You can try that all on your own. There's some questions up here for you to answer. There's, um, and then uh, there's a, 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 a couple questions down here. Um, well, you guys can look at the answer key and see what the answers are to these questions, but we'll also talk about it in class if we need to. But you can try answering those questions. But uh, what's really important is at the end of um, topic three, there's this question at the very end of topic three, if you look at your notes. And this is a question that we need to talk about in this video because um, it's going to be really important for, for the lab we're going to be doing this unit. Um, and so I want to walk you guys through this. I'll do it together with you. Um, obviously, you could just look at the answer key and copy it, but you need to not do that because if you don't understand it, your next lab and your lab report is going to be awful because you're not going to understand anything um, because you just copied me. So let me explain it and walk you through it, and we can kind of set it up together. But in this scenario, what it says, it says potato cubes were placed in five different sucrose solutions, each with a different concentration. Um, the mass of the cubes were taken before and after 15 minutes of being in the solution. And then it says to, to calculate the percent change of each potato cube and graph the percent change relative to solution concentration and draw a line of best fit. And so if you look here, there was a, 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 a solution that had a sucrose concentration of zero, which basically just means it was pure water. There was no sucrose dissolved in it. And they put um, a potato cube, so they had a, a potato that they chopped up into a cube um, that initially had a mass of 10 grams. And then they put it in this pure water, this, this, constant, this solution here. And then after 15 minutes, they took it out and took the mass, the new mass. And you can see the mass went up. Um, and they did that um, for five different solutions here. Uh, for, they also did that for a potato cube that went into a 0.2 molar sucrose solution and a 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 molar sucrose solution. And these were the masses of the cubes before and after soaking in those different sucrose solutions. And so uh, what they want you to do first is calculate the percent change. So the formula for percent change, um, this is something that you guys commonly have to do on the AP test is find the percent change of something. And there's no, they don't give you a formula for that. This is just a basic math operation you're expected to be able to do is calculate the percent change in something. And so I'll tell you the formula, though. You might want to write it on top of your paper. The percent change equals, you're going to do the final value minus the initial value. And you're going to subtract that first. 
And then you're going to divide by whatever the initial value was and times it by 100. That would be your, how you calculate percent change. So I'll give you an example with this first one. The initial was 10 grams and the final mass was 13 grams. So if I was trying to find the percent change, what I would do is I would just do um, the final 13 minus the initial 10. And then I would divide that by the initial, which is 10, and times it by 100. Um, and that's how you guys would set up this first one. So on your calculator, you have to be careful, though. When you use 13 minus 10, you need, your, you need to force your calculator to do that first. So if you're using a scientific calculator, you could add parentheses and then divide by 10 and times it by 100. Or you can just push equals when you subtract to make your calculator do that first. So on my calculator, for example, Let's say I'm being lazy. You can do 13 minus 10, but then you need to make you need to force your calculator to subtract before you end up dividing and multiplying. So I'm just going to push equals to make it subtract those two numbers, and then I'm going to push divide by 10 and times 100, and then I find out that the percent change is 30. So the percent change for this would be 30 percent. But be careful because this is what a lot of you do by accident: is you type it in like this. You do 13 minus 10 divided by 10. Um, times 100, and this equals something way off. This is not the percent change, and that's because your calculator divided and multiplied before it subtracted because it's going to follow the order of operations. So just be careful of that. Um, so then you guys can go ahead and do the same thing for these other ones and see if you actually know how to do it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and fill in the answers here, but uh, I would encourage you to not just copy me and make sure that you're getting the same values as me when you plug it into your calculator. So this one was 30%. Um, this next one is going to be 16.7%. And then this one's going to be 11.1%. And I'm just rounding to one decimal place just because. And then this one's going to be, this This fourth one's actually going to be negative 5%. So be careful because sometimes you could have a negative percent change. And that's because the mass went down. It didn't go up. And this last one, going to be negative 18.2%. Um, Whereas these ones right here, these are all positive percent changes because the mass was going up. And these are negative percent changes because the mass was going down. Um, so there's the percent changes. Now, I want to talk about why the mass is changing. The mass, because this is going to tie into a lot of different examples that you guys get on test questions. Whenever you have a situation like this where you're taking something and you're soaking it in a solution and measuring the change in mass. Um, like in our lab, we're going to do dialysis tubing and we're going to put it in different solutions and see how the mass changes. We're also going to use potato cubes in a lab to measure how, and put them in different sucrose solutions to see how their mass changes. And what I need you guys to know is that the, the what's causing the mass to change is primarily, um, almost exclusively, because of the movement of water into or out of that thing. And so it's not so much the movement of sugar. So there's very small amounts of sugar that we're talking about when we're looking at cells and how much diffusion of, of the sugar is happening. But water, there's a lot of water inside and outside the cell. And that movement of water is going to account for these, these mass changes. And so just, just know that whenever we have a situation like this where the mass is changing, that mass is 100% corresponding to, the, to the, the overall movement of water. And so in this case, like the first one, I see that the um, cube gained mass, which tells me that there was a net movement of water into the potato cube cells. So the cells that make up the potato cube, they were gaining water. And that's why they were gaining mass, because they were gaining water. Whereas these guys, they were losing mass, because the potato cells in the cube, they were losing water. The water was moving from the cubes to the solution outside of the, the cubes. Whereas up here, the water was moving from the solution into the cubes, which is why they had a positive percent change in mass. Um, so just be careful to, that you're thinking about water when you're looking at these percent changes. So if something's gaining mass, it's because it must have been gaining water. Why is it gaining water? Well, that's for you to figure out why is it gaining water. If you guys look, hopefully, maybe you're already thinking about it. This potato cell was placed in a, a solution that was zero molar. So I would imagine very likely that that potato cell is more concentrated than the surrounding solution. So the stuff, this there's probably some sugar dissolved inside the potato cells 
and water is going to move to where there's a higher concentration. And if the concentration outside the potato is zero, well, then water is probably going to move into the potato cells where there's a higher concentration of sugar. And then the opposite would be true for these negative percent changes in mass. Um, and so that's what this question is asking here. It says, explain why in some solutions there is a positive change in mass and why in others there was a negative change in mass. And I'll go ahead and tell you right now, it's because some of these potato cells were placed in a hypotonic solution and water was moving, um, water would have been moving into the potato cells. And some of these potatoes were placed in a hypertonic solution and water was moving out of those potato cells, which is why the mass is either going up or down in those potatoes. Um, so it actually has, has a lot to do with what, what is the concentration of sucrose in the potato versus outside the concentration of sucrose um, in the solution that it was soaking in. And so the next thing we're going to do, so I'm not going to answer this question for you, but I basically answered it for you. So try to come up with a good answer for that. Um, I want to set up this graph with you, though. And so we're going to graph this data. It wants us to graph um, the percent change of each potato cube um, relative to the sucrose concentration. And so we're going to have the sucrose concentration on the x-axis because that's the independent variable. The, these, that's, that's how I'm intentionally making these different groups different. Um, I'm, I'm changing the concentration that the potato is being measured in. Um, and then the the the, the dependent variable would be the percent change in mass. That's what I'm going to measure to see how it's related to this, this difference that I set up in these groups. And so on the uh, x-axis, we'll put the sucrose concentration, which if I'm scaling this, I have like, I don't know how many boxes this is, but um, we're obviously going to have to start at zero and make it to 0 0.8, and we're going to scale this. And so I'll go ahead and say that um, every box is 0.8. Zero 0.5, I think, would space this out nicely. So for example, um, if I start at zero right here, and I say that this every every square, every line is 0 0.05, this would be 0 0.05, this would be 0 0.1, 0 0.15, this would be 0 0.2. So I'm just going to list out some of these values. And then 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, and then I'm going to continue that. So something like that. Um, and so to label this, this would be the sucrose concentration. Um, and that's in molarity that we're measuring the concentration. And that's for the, the solution, the, the sucrose concentration of the solution that the potato cubes were soaking in. And then on the y-axis, I'm going to scale the y-axis to fit these percent changes. I have uh, my lowest number here, which is negative 18, all the way to positive 30. That's about, well, negative 20 to positive 30. That's a range of 50, which um, is kind of an unfortunate range because if I make every unit equal 2, that would only get me to 40. And so I'm going to say every unit equals 4. That's going to be my scale for the the y-axis, every unit, every line equals 4%. And I'm just going to start at negative 20. And so this would be negative 20. because We've got some negative values, so we got to start negative. We can't start at zero. Um, and then I'll say every unit is 4. So this would be negative 16, negative 12, negative 8, negative 4. So that means this would be zero right here. And then 4%, 8%, 12%, 16%, this would be 20%. And then 24, 28, 32, 36, this would be 40% right here. And so that's good enough to fit all my numbers. Um, and this, I would label this, this would be the, 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 the change, the percent change in mass. I'll just write percent change in mass which the unit for that is percent, which I said right here, so I don't need to, I included the unit by saying these are percents. And so then you guys are going to carefully um, plot some points here. Um, we're going to make a scatter plot. So we're going to plot our data as dots on this graph, and then we're going to make a line of best fit. That's what it wants us to do. And so um, 
quickly and carefully plot this. And so for the Sucrose concentration of zero, the percent change was positive 30, which that would be, this is 24, 28, 32. So that would be halfway right there between 32 and, I mean, between 28 and 32. And then the next one is 16%, point, 16.7 which be like, I don't know, somewhere right there. Oh wait, negative 16 is right here. I mean, positive 16 is right here, so just above that. Forgot that every unit equals um, four. And then I have 11%, which if this is zero, that's gonna be four, eight, 12. So right before 12, somewhere right there. I'm not messing up here. And then I have minus five for the next one. So this is zero and then negative five. Well, the next line is negative four. So negative five would be just right after that. And then lastly, I have negative 18. If this is negative 20 and this is negative 16, then negative 20 would be right there. And so there's my data plotted. And then you can see there's a linear relationship here. As the sucrose concentration is increasing, the percent change in mass is decreasing, starting off positive and then ultimately becoming more and more negative. And so then I'm going to draw a line of best fit through this using a straight edge. So, I don't know, I'll just say that. It's good enough to me. And then, um, so there's our graph, okay? Um, so then there's something really important we need to learn from this graph. So what's going on in this graph is at certain sucrose concentrations, the, um, the potatoes are gaining mass, which they're, they're gaining mass because that must mean inside the potato, it's more concentrated than these concentrations. Um, so water is moving into the potato cells, causing them to increase mass. But then you get to a point where they become negative. And at those sucrose concentrations, it looks like now the concentration is more, the sucrose, out, the solution outside the cells is more concentrated than inside the cells. Because I can see that water is now moving out of the cells, causing these negative percent changes. And so a a really important thing to find from this graph, or one thing that we could find from this graph is we could actually use this graph to figure out what is the sol solute concentration of the potato cells. Like if I asked you, okay, after doing this experiment, what is the concentration of sugar inside the potato cells? You can actually use this graph to, to, to estimate very accurately what is the concentration of sucrose inside the potato cells. And to do that, you would just have to find out where where would the isotonic solution have been? So in an isotonic solution, you have the same concentration inside and outside the cell, and there would be no net movement of water. So theoretically, if in one of these potato cubes, the mass didn't change after 15 minutes, it stayed the same number, that would um, suggest that the potato was in an isotonic solution, which would be matching the concentration inside the potato. Now, if you guys look at these numbers, in, in none of our trials did the potato not gain or lose mass. But if you look at my graph here, I can estimate where that might have been. Like where would, have, where would 0% have been? Because if the potato had changed 0%, that must mean that it wasn't gaining or losing water. And that would only be true if it was in an isotonic solution that matched perfectly the concentration inside the potato. Like that that would be my, my potato concentration. And so on here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw, I guess a dotted line, like to see where does it intercept my graph here? And it looks like it's right about here, which this is gonna be a little different depending on how you guys graph your line of best fit. But right here is where I'm, I'm, I'm predicting this would have been 0% change according to my, my trend here. And if I look at the corresponding concentration on the x-axis, it looks like that would have been a little higher than 0.5. Um, I'm going to say that would have been, uh, well, this is 0.5 and this is 0.55. So maybe I would say that's 0.52 molar. And so I could say with somewhat confidence 
that the concentration of sugar inside the potato is likely around 0.5, according to my line of best fit, which again, isn't the perfect line of best fit, um, but mine is suggesting 0.52-ish for the concentration of sucrose inside the potato, because that's where I'm predicting there would have been 0% change. Like I didn't, I didn't test a 0.5 concentrated solution, but if I had, according to my trend, it's suggesting that that probably would have been 0% change, which would have meant and matched the concentration of sugar inside the potato. So this is really important. This comes up on test questions, on the AP test. They show you data like this or a graph like this, and you have to use that information to, to, to predict things about the concentration of the, of the thing that was changing mass. And you can do that by, well, if you know it was gaining mass in certain solutions, that means it was, it was gaining water, and that means that it was in a hypotonic solution because inside the cell it's more concentrated, so water was moving into the cells. And if it was losing mass, that means water was moving out of the cells, which would be in a hypertonic solution, uh, which is the solution is more concentrated than inside the cell. But if the mass didn't change at all, like zero, that would be an isotonic solution that matched the concentration inside the potato. And so using that, I can then calculate the water potential inside the potato cells, and it tells me to assume the pressure potential is zero. So to figure this out, the water potential would equal the pressure potential plus the solute potential. And so they're telling me the pressure potential is zero, so I can kind of ignore that. So really, the water potential equals the solute potential, which equals negative I... CRT. So you guys would plug this in. And so when I plug this in, look carefully at what I'm going to do here. That means for, well, there's a negative. Don't forget the negative. For I, since we're talking about sucrose, sucrose is sugar. That has an ionization constant of one. Now C, that's the concentration of the potato. Like what, if I'm trying to find the water potential inside the potato cells, I need to know the concentration inside the potato cells. And that you guys was literally the whole point of all of this. Like we just figured out the concentration inside the potato cells using this data and this trend and this graph and our line of best fit. We figured it out. It was 0.52. Like we, that's what we, th that's what I think it is. Yours might be a little different. So I'm going to plug in 0.52. I think that's the molarity are the concentration of sugar inside the potato cells. And then for R, that's a constant. That's just 0 0.0831. And then for T, that's the temperature. Um, notice that I never said what the temperature is. I keep every year, I realize I forget to write the temperature somewhere. Um, so we, we, we would need to know the temperature, um, and it doesn't say anywhere what the temperature is. So I'm just going to make up a temperature. Let's pretend that the temperature put up here, you can put temp equals 22 degrees Celsius. Just pretend that that was the temperature at which this experiment was taking place, which would be the temperature inside the potato. And so um, don't plug in 22, though, for temperature. You have to plug in Kelvin. So in Kelvin, that would be 295. So then you would plug in all of that, I, C, R, T, and then you would get your, your water potential inside the, the potato, which, um, let's see what that would equal. Um, 0.52 times 0 0.0831 times 295. And it looks like for me, that's 12.75. And that would be bars. And then you guys can see, I already forgot my negative. Let that start burning in your head to not forget the negative. It's negative 12.75 bars. At least for my example with my line of best fit. Yours might be a little different, okay? Um, but anyway, that's, this is exactly what's going to happen in part two of our diffusion and osmosis lab. Um, we're going to, we're going to use potatoes as well, and we're going to put them in different concentrations of sucrose to figure out how their mass changes and then use all that information to ultimately make a graph and figure out, okay, what is the concentration of sugar inside those potato cells? And then we could use that to then find the water potential inside those potato cells, just like we did right here. So this is a good, like mini practice version of all of that. Um, anyway, that's it for this video. Sorry it was long, but hopefully that helps clarify some of these questions at the end here for topic three. I will see you guys later.